Yeah, hi. Um, I had a question referring to the possibility of a TV series. Like, what were your feelings about that? How far is it in the future? If it'll ever come? Uh, we are, as you know, doing, uh, we started a little, our little pilot TV series with Clone Wars. And uh, we are now going to move that into a 3D animation. Lucasfilm Animation was a completely new division. And no one really knew what we were up to behind the main house. Uh, that, that was a constant theme in the early days. People not really understanding what Clone Wars was, not ever, never hearing of Lucasfilm Animation. When we were starting the production and building the studio, it was a collaboration of getting people from various backgrounds 2D artists, 3D artists, and live action. I think one of the things that really helped the crew at the beginning was being in a house where it didn't feel like you were working at the office. We weren't in cubes. And it was like a small family working on this project that we had no idea how we were gonna do it. And it was just that time of just trying to figure out what we we're gonna do that was very exciting. George had a good idea of what he wanted this thing to be, but the rest of us honestly had no clue because it was so ambitious and it was such a crazy thing to attempt. I took this job because I've always wanted to work at Lucasfilm. It was my dream growing up. It was amazing to come up to the ranches every day. You're listening to the Grand Army of the Republic broadcast, the voice of the Outer Rim. This next one goes out to the mud jumpers of the 224th, slugging it out on the One of the greatest assets we had at the ranch was uh, the Lucasfilm archive. I mean, it's, it is the heaven that every Star Wars fan wants to visit. It's the, the barn where all of your childhood dreams sit. And we would use it to do research. Seeing all that stuff in person is just, it's amazing. Seeing it in photographs is one thing, but actually being able to pick it up and look at it, it's really helped inform a lot of our designs. You know, we used to try to go down there for anything. Any any little otter end to the archive, you know, and you just get in touch with that nostalgia, the reality of it. Uh, I mean, we honestly were researching, but it was awesome. You know, it was interesting, Rob Coleman turned up. He was gonna kind of help us with our um, beginning animation production unit. So it was great having Rob there in the beginning. He was a you know great mentor to me in the early days as far as just how to you know get used to George and communicate with him. And I remember we were going into our first big review of what the character design was going to look like with George, and that was basically the drawings of the character design sense for the Clone Wars, and then uh, Darren Marshall's maquettes. And I'll never forget in that first review, you know, um, George said, "This is good," referring to the drawings. They looked at Darren Marshall's maquette of Obi Wan Kenobi, and he said, "But this is great." The first season was largely story ideas by Henry Gilroy and I. And about halfway through that, George started coming in with like stories that he wanted to tell. He and I would sit down with a writer and he would go over the beats of the story and we would kind of debate and try to help come up with the beats of the story. And I would draw every day, tons of drawings, and we would outline extensively every episode together. The first 12 episodes, we were strictly doing storyboards. A pipeline that's been around since uh, Snow White, you know. But then George kind of dropped a bomb on us, especially me, and said that ultimately he didn't want to do storyboards. And what I've learned is that George doesn't really work uh, in a vacuum where it's just like, he's just gonna do the story. He also wants to push the technology. He does, he does both. And Zviz is where that technology uh, push was. George wanted to skip the whole storyboard process and just shoot it in CG. In retrospect, that's when we really hit the ground running. And that's when we really picked up steam. It, 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 made a, it, it might have taken a bit of time to, to get there with the transition, but 
really in retrospect it was a great thing and things got a lot smoother after that. The beauty of Zivis from an editorial standpoint is that we'd get a fully realized environment to work in. We didn't need to guess what was trying to be represented by a storyboard. We had a very fast schedule and we also wanted to have the freedom to explore a lot of story ideas within that tight schedule. So Ziva's really helped us do that. This is how George is. He always thinks like 10 steps ahead of everyone else and ways to make artists more creative. If I was watching a shot in editorial and I wanted to change the camera, swing it over here a little bit and push it in, we just go back to the desk and swing it over, push it in, and it's done by the later seasons of Clone Wars. It was a virtual film studio all on your desktop. And that's definitely the legacy of the Clone Wars, I think, at this point, which is when you really watch the Clone Wars, especially when we were hitting our stride at season three all the way to season six, uh, you're going to see something that you really rarely ever see in animation, which is a live action sensibility. And I'll clearly say, because of his vision to use Zivis uh, as a part of our production, I am a significantly better filmmaker. Um, I'm not sure that's all that's working. I just be careful because a lot of shots where you have something in the foreground that's soft. Mm -hmm. I know what you're doing, but uh, I'm not sure anybody else is going to figure it out. It just looks like the shot's soft because you, you look and you immediately see a big soft thing and then you say, oh. He was such a big influence on Clone Wars, which was really a thrill, I think, for everybody working up at animation because we got to be so intimately involved with him. The series wouldn't be what it became if there hadn't been someone pushing that hard to make it more than what it already was. See, she takes forever to turn. So I would, I would cut just before she turns. George's impact on the show is definitely editorial. Uh, George's impact on the show is story. His love of the serial shines through in that traditional uh, serial way that works every time. You could tell that he loved the project and loved the work that he did, and uh, you could see it across the board that you're doing work that's going to be in front of George. It better be your best. You know, I thought it, in some ways for George, it was the realization of what he always wanted the ranch to be a, a place where people could make movies um, right there on the, on the property, and we were doing that. Um, we were an extension of his Star Wars brain. A second off. Can you turn the volume up a little bit? Yeah. Well, because you're sitting back there in the peanut gallery? Yeah. <laughs> you demand to hear what's going on? <laughs> I quit. I can't take this anymore. Uh oh. You know, I really respected that history. I, I felt a connection between that building that we were in the entire ranch property and the making of Star Wars, you know, and I think we really felt like we were a part of that continuing story and I felt it was really important that we worked on the ranch and that we tie aspects of the ranch itself and the people there to um, the show as had always been tradition in Star Wars. From the early days, the earliest crew to the final crew, we had a really special thing and it was eight years of production with you know no break longer than two weeks over that eight years pretty much for any of us. The fast pace that we had on Clone Wars really prepared us for Rebels. It's not really an exaggeration to say that you couldn't make Rebels if you hadn't made Clone Wars. Just the amount of sort of lessons learned and, and all the experience. And Filoni has done such an amazing job in taking all of what George has taught him and continued to push through and bring us the Star Wars that we all know. So it's that he had the ultimate mentor, the ultimate teacher, and so now he's mentoring all of us. There's not a day I don't think about like what the opportunity that we had to tell stories, work on Star Wars, but completely be around people that you love hanging out with even after work, you know? For most people, that, that's really rare. I loved always the conversations that we did have because they would go on and on and on. The nerdiest debates that you can ever imagine. Nerd of the week, nerd of the month, and nerd of the year. I just remember winning three times. I did win one of the sort of nerd of the year competitions, but it was a group effort. So welcome to the feud. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I, 
ask Pablo, could we put a survey up for uh, all our fans? This is what that was? That was <laughs> <laughs> Apparently Dave was one of them. Uh, <laughs> Pajanica is kind of like the Seinfeld equivalent of Festivus. The first Christmas we did Lucasfilm Animation, we had a really nice small little potluck where everybody brought some food in and we did the whole exchange gifts thing. And Pushan, who is one of the texture artists on the show, he was sort of tasked with helping put the whole sort of potluck together. And for some reason, I think Filoni sort of caught on to that and realized that Pushan was doing all this work. And, and then we'd sort of, he had sort of adopted the name Pushanika for the event. Most people would refer to it as that other name, um, but in reality, I think we all knew in our heart of hearts that it was Lao and Apatla. Pushanika, it sounded right. You know, it sounded like some cryptic holiday that had always been there. It was more for the family of everyone. The kids could come and Dave would dress up as Santa and hand out Legos and lightsabers and stuff like that. And, and Pushan instantly hated it because it was named after him. And he, and to this day, he will not refer to the holiday as Pushanika. Pushanika has t-shirts, it has posters, people wrote carols, and we had the Pushanika choir sing songs at one event. People on the crew looked forward to Pashanika more than they looked forward to Christmas. The kids I know definitely did. It is Lal Anam Potluck. To me, when I look back at Clone Wars, I think of all the people that made it. I have great memories of all of them. When we were on the same show day in, day out, and we watched that thing grow. We watched it get more complex the look of it, the, the, the technical aspects of it. The rooster tails in the episode Trespass were kind of like the whole spark of a change in the show. Changed the visual look of the show, changed what we were capable of doing in the show. You know, we would not compare ourselves to like what was going on else around us in television land, more looking at what was going on at ILM and in the local theater and saying, well, how are we gonna do those things? People want Star Wars to look like those things, you know. And the grand scale of effects, none of them are really that revolutionary per se, except for the, the speed with which we were executing this stuff. I can't stress enough the overseas studios that worked with us on Clone Wars. One was our own homegrown studio, Lucasfilm Animation Singapore. Uh, one was Polygon Pictures. But the backbone of Star Wars The Clone Wars was CGCG. They were so experienced. And then the two of us, we kind of grew together as a unit and they just crushed it. When we won an Emmy for that show, I, I felt it, it didn't represent any one season. It represented all the work of everybody that, that had taken any amount of time to work on that thing. You yeah, had to earn it and I think all those people earned it. The show was on its sixth season, and we knew there was a possibility that it would be coming to an end. So it was, it was difficult to know that that was going to go away. Um, but at the same time, you can't live the dream forever. It's amazing how character building that show was for me and how it was for other people that made it through that production. And I remember standing in line on one of those last days waiting to get my portrait taken by Joel. People were pretty real in those, in those portraits. It was amazing. It was sort of the end of an era with George telling Star Wars stories. I was taking portraits all day long. I was talking to people. I was talking to them about what they're gonna do, what their lives are gonna be like. And I just shot in that moment and stayed in that moment the entire time. And to this day, I just get emotional thinking about it. Yeah, when I look back on Clone Wars, it, it's a very special time. Its connection to George especially makes it unique. You know, as we've moved beyond that, it's about legacy and continuing that work. 
of what is Star Wars. It's integral to our future at Lucasfilm that we maintain it, which is why in part we created Star Wars Rebels, you know, to further our own artistic journey and experimentation with what makes something Star Wars. And I'm very proud of everybody on the staff. We are still fans to this day. You know, the sadness for me is in some of the people that I've left, that I worked for a long time, but they've gone on. Many of them are doing incredible things elsewhere. And so I'm, I'm excited and proud of them working with, with what they're doing now. And the people that are still here are still doing great things. And I see that they took the lessons they learned on Clone Wars and that they're still moving forward and, and making Star Wars true to what it is. That's what that team of people offers. Um, and, and I hope to be doing it for a long, long time in, in this galaxy right now and in the future. <laughs>